today, I want to talk about this. Commitment. Commitment is a very important word, but also it's very, um, the word that people avoid, uh, try to avoid it. Many people, especially this generation, it's not an easy word, isn't it? No one wants to commit to something too much that you feel stuck. But you know, commitment is a very important concept because in the Bible, that how God showed his commitment to us through promises and he fulfills it. It's all about he made a commitment and he kept it and he showed his faithfulness to us. If God is not the God of a commitment, we are all in trouble because we will always be uh, insecure. We always, we wonder how he's going to, uh, where he's going to go and how he's going to change his mind. But the God who made the commitment, reading Bible helps us where he made the commitment, where his commitment lies. But today is just not just about the God's commitment, but our commitment. Our commitment makes everything um, meaningful and relevant and safe and secure. In relationship, you need a commitment, don't you? Without the commitment, and you cannot really achieve anything. You cannot always be, you cannot have the safety in your family and children, right? So how do I define commitment? I'm going to define commitment like this today. Going a long walk in one direction. Commitment, if you see biblical pattern as well, it's not really a bad sprint. You just go run fast in, from one place to another, right? And you drop the ball. Okay, I finished my job. But it's actually a marathon going through long journey, long walk, even slow pace. Sometimes you stop, sometimes you step back way, but you continue to walk in one direction. We call that a commitment. Why this commitment is important? Because one of the, the biggest issues that I would have as a pastor when I look back is not that whether we have a great event or camp or you know Christmas party, whether I will have uh, the people who is able to do this kind of stuff. My greatest issue as a pastor or struggle that I have with the people in the church is because there's not many people who knows how to walk in one direction long enough. In the long haul, because this generation don't have that concept. They don't know the definition of a com commitment. They know exactly go somewhere fast and get there and they so get uh, joyful and uh, they, bet, uh, what, what they don't want to run that way. They're good at it even. But are we good at staying one place, building something strong and firm? The benefit of having commitment is that you will be able to look back and you see that how God has worked through in your day-to-day -day life. You can see his fingerprint and you know how firm and strong and mature, real Christian you are, you become. Without this, you will always be a Christian who goes season after season, go through the season of a high season of low and you always go around. Uh, what do you call this? Treadmill and you never get anywhere. Have you ever felt like that? End of the year is a good time for you to think about. We started this year with a strong passion, vision. But where are we? How many of you guys read the Bible? Started from, we start with our Genesis chapter 1. How many of you guys are still stuck in Genesis chapter 2? <laughs> How many of you guys still feel like uh, you thought you were good with God, but you find yourself exactly the same place you were? in the beginning of this year. You know why? Because you don't understand the concept of commitment. As a church, why we don't enjoy church as much as we should? Why it feels like it becomes a chore and struggles all the time? Because you don't know what it looks like going on a long walk and enjoying the scenery, but going in one direction together. Let me read the Bible passage, Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 16. Can you hear me all right, John? Okay. Oh, that's all right. You know, you're okay. All right. Three, 14. Let me read. To, let's read together. One, two, go. To the church in Laodicea, 
And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So this is such one of the seven letters that in Revelation that uh, God is reading, uh, uh, writing to. Um, it's a literally a message to the whole church. The number seven is the seven, the number of perfect word, right? It's perfect number. And they start with this, who this author is, who is writing the words of the amen, the, the yes, the, the one who is actually making say yes to everything, the faithful, the one who is so faithful, the one who is able to commit and pull, pull it through. And true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And he says to the church, to Laodicea like this. I know your works. He knows you. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were, uh, would that you were uh, either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. He starts with this uh, rebuke. <laughs> Now, out of seven churches that he wrote, the only two churches has a praise. All the other five churches have a certain thing to rebuke about. This is a very important message because there's no other passages in the Bible. God was like a concise talk about each individual churches and their condition and their rem remedy and their cure and their disease. It talks about that. Well, this is one of the things that, uh, the, uh, that God is talking to this church. Problem is that you are neither cold nor hot. All right, let's understand this, shall we? What does that mean when it said you should be either cold or hot? Traditional understanding is that God wants you to be cold as in really away from God and completely ignoring God and just live that way. Or hot or passionate. God does not like anything in the between. We understood that way. I remember that I preached that sermon on that along the line as well. But still, you know, we have a question. Why God want us to be cold? I can understand why God want us to be hot. But why God want us to be cold? Our expl explanation before is that if you're a complete non-Christian, you know, you can be, uh, you can have opportunity to repent, to come back. But if you are lukewarm in between, you have this false sense of security. You think you're okay. You're in this warm place. A comfortable place where you don't want to grow up. You don't want to get closer to God. And that's a dangerous place. It sounds good. It's sort of truth, but not perfectly truth. Because recent archaeological discovery found the city of Laodicea, they have these two water streams. From the south, there's a really hot water, a hot a spring water which can be used for the healing and are really useful for something. And from the north, there's the cold, another strand, water stream is very cold, refreshing. People can drink it. You know, it's very useful because of its coldness. Do you see what I'm saying here? So when this cold is really cold, so clear about what that is, I mean, what it meant to be, then it's useful. Hot, when it's really hot, it be, uh, it is what it is meant to be then it is actually useful. But when they join together in the, this two stream meet, two good things come together and they mix it and become lukewarm. It's not cold enough to bring the refreshment. It's not hot enough to bring the healing in the body. It become useless. This typical example, how Christian can live fruitless life because they just have a uh, simply too many options. It's not bad thing mixing, contaminating the good thing. Two good thing comes, and we don't know what to uh, and what to be like. And the whole point is that your fruitless life, your fruitless life matters to God. You cannot just live. Every day, just as you like, without producing the true fruit, right? And Jesus got angry as well. You know, if you read the gospel, Jesus was a curse, a tree, because there was no fruit in the fig tree. God hates the fruitlessness. And this is what God responded, how God responded, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, 
I will spit you out of my mouth. Can you believe this loving God who died for on the cross for all the sins of the world actually saying this? He's shown grace after grace, forgiveness after forgiveness. He said to you, because your fruitlessness, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It went inside, but he's going to spit you out of my mouth. So the image is that people trying to drink the water thinking it's cold and drinking oh, it's lukewarm. Or trying to drink the hot water thinking it's hot and drinking it's so lukewarm. And, and it's uh, the spitting it out. God is trying to find the way to, 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 to use you and you are useless. Why is it? Because you just don't know how to commit. Next passage shows a bit more clearer. Next passage, not to James. Can you go next one, next one? For you say, I am rich and I prospered and I need, the, I need nothing. See, there's a sense of this security as well. Yeah, you are, you are lukewarm because I got a bit of a cold. I got a bit of a warm, right? Warm and a hot. So I, I don't need anything. So you have a one step in the world, one step in the in, in God. Maybe things like this. I need nothing, not realizing that you are actually the way God sees you. You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, the way God assesses you is so different to the way you assess your, yourself. And he goes on saying, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. He basically saying that, hey, realize, understand your nakedness, your blindness, your poverty. That's the only way you can come to me to find the solution. Just being where you are, just sitting where you are, doing whatever you've been doing. Same thing over and over again. Without you being honest to yourself, you will not, you will not truly please God. In fact, not just pleasing God, not pleasing God. Really, God hates your fruitlessness in your life. Can I share with you something? That is in my heart these days when it comes to church. I have to confess before the Lord that I, would, I thought I was a good pastor because I was trying to be faithful, nice to people, kind to people. I tried to embrace everybody, which is actually, I want to do that, continue to do that, loving on anybody come to that door. But one thing I was seriously lacking is that I don't allow or I don't help people to become either cold or hot. I don't help people to commit with one thing and just take on long journey together. I guess it's because it's my confession. You right? hear me, right? Um, my journey for last 20 years ministry, uh, my strategy was go to a church, an established church and move on. And I was more apostolic. I'm a church planter. I've been doing that last two year, uh, 20 years. But when we start this church, um, that five years ago with my wife, hey, this is going to be my last stop. I realized I can't help people to truly grow up and grow a mature Christian if I don't help them to commit to one thing in the long journey of their life. Happy church will not work if you are not in it for long haul. I can tell you that today. That's why we're going through the season. Get off if you are not going to be in your long haul, right? But get on. Understand this is a season. We're all going to come together. Let's take a walk. We don't have to go fast. We don't have to go rush. We're going to have to sprint. We may take time. It's not about the speed, but it's about the direction. But we want to commit. We're going to long, direct, long walk together in one direction. Do you know next year, May, March, is our Harpy's fifth anniversary. Wow, this is quite crazy, isn't it? And I've been with the only church. Uh, I mean, the I mean, they finished, but it was four years now, right? And uh, also next year, March will be my this heartbeat will be officially my longest serving church I ever done in my whole entire ministry. 
It's a kind of exciting too, but also let me scratch my head a while. I wonder last 20 years, what if I stayed in one church in the long haul? What would it be like? And I doubt, I don't doubt that God has planned for me and that God used me that way. So that was a great thing happened. I don't deny that. I don't reject that. But for this season, I just want to tell you guys through this passage, let's commit. I want to commit. I think for all of us to try to really do so many things will not really make you to get wherever you want. God wants fruitfulness. Is, for example, you know, see yourself in 10 years down the track. Can you be truly fruitful you know, in Christ? And how can you be fruitful if you are not committed to this one thing? One of the things that actually hinders us to commit anything is that because we keep our doors open, our options open sometimes. I remember a long time ago when we started this church, the beginning church was hard because everybody had to you know, pull in and everybody had to work together and all that. But very, actually, I remember how enjoyable, exciting was when everybody's setting up the chair just like this right now, set up and pack up and all that. It was hard, remember, Drummond, Chris? But it was actually, it, remind, it reminds me how that back then it was very good. And everybody bonded, everybody struggled together. But I remember this one couple came to me and says, Pastor Joshua, we're leaving church. And because there's no kids ministry, I'll come back when there's a kids ministry, when your church gets, it's actually good. So she, they left and I have no issue with people leaving. Trust me, that's what I have. I have absolutely no issue with that. You know, it's painful, but I think people have to go, they go. But I think, what's the point of people coming back when the church is good? And you know, don't you think we should commit when the church really need each other and really build together? You know, I really think that these people, instead of having so many options out there, I can go to church next week. If I don't like it, I'll go to church because there are so many options there. If you are in that kind of mindset, if you're that kind of pattern, you will never grow. Because you never commit to anything. You never invest into anything. You never sow the seed in any field. Make sense? I got this, um, I'm not sure that you saw this from my Facebook. I got this video. I want to just share with you guys. And I speak so poignantly, I mean, this so perfectly about what are we about to, uh, what are we sharing today? It's late at night and you start browsing Netflix looking for something to watch. You scroll through different titles. You even read a few reviews, but you just can't commit to watching any given movie. Suddenly it's been 30 minutes and you're still stuck in infinite browsing mode. So you just give up. You're too tired to watch anything now. So you cut your losses and fall asleep. I've come to believe that this is the defining characteristic of our generation. <laughs> Let's call it keeping our options open. <laughs> Leaving home and coming here is a lot like entering a long hallway. You walk out of the room in which you grew up and into this place with thousands of different doors to infinitely browse. When Hollywood tells tales of courage, they usually take the form of slaying the dragon. It's all about the big brave moments. The most menacing dragons that stand in the way are the everyday boredom and distraction and uncertainty that can erode our ability to commit to anything for the long haul. As I've grown older here, I've also started seeing the downsides of having so many open doors. Nobody wants to be stuck behind a locked door, but nobody wants to live in a hallway either. It's great to have options when you lose interest in something, but I've learned here that the more times I do this, the less satisfied I am with any given option. And lately, the experiences I crave are less the rushes of novelty and more those perfect Tuesday nights when you eat dinner with the friends who you have known for a long time, who you've made a commitment to, and who won't quit you because they found someone better. We may have come here to help keep our options open, but I leave believing that the most radical act we can take is to make a commitment to a particular thing, to a place, 
to a profession, to a cause, to a community, to a person. To show our love for something by working at it for a long time. And to close doors and forego options for its sake. We need not be afraid, for we have in our possession the antidote to our dread, our time, free to be dedicated to the slow but necessary work of turning visions into projects, values into practices, and strangers into neighbors. We should pick a damn movie and see it all the way through. Hey, you like it? It's funny that how I, trust me, I didn't preach, decide to, oh, I'm going to preach on this. No, I picked the sermon first and this thing came to me and a God working in a quite interesting way sometimes. James chapter 1 says this. James chapter 1, 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I've seen many Christians come to church and they have a deep inside, they have doubt. They doubt of the existence of God. I can't call them even a Christian but they look like Christians because they come to church every week. The reason they're constantly struggling in the doubt is because they never seen God in action. They never will allow God to touch them deep in the heart of a heart and show who He is in their life. They don't have the fingerprint of God in their heart. Why is it? Because they don't know how to commit they are like uh, the people, double-minded people. The, 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 the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind is like the people like that. You will not receive anything from God if that's you. In relationship, in your faith, in your job, in your career, whatever you want to achieve, that if you constantly have that pattern, back and forth, moving one place to another, you never learn how to go long haul. You will not get anywhere. You practice something long enough, you become an expert. But the key is not just practicing, but about practicing long enough. Let's come back to church. I believe the heartbeat has uh, something special, unique quality to offer in this city, in this generation. Do you believe this? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure you got convinced the amazing grace upon this church. If you don't believe, my, me, my, you ask my wife. She grew up as a second generation in Australia. She would never seen a church like this, independent church that growing all together like this. We have children running around like this. But this story only just begun. And if you want to make it happen, I believe in my heart, we cannot just play around this anymore. We need to decide to go long haul. We need people who commit to this. That's why we're spending for next few weeks, months, giving you enough time to decide. I know many of you guys were well, not here, but you know, figuratively speaking, so a lot of you guys, especially PM service, will go on going through season of discerning which church you want to commit to. Good, good on you. Take your time. But once you decide, can I just encourage you? Stay there. Invest into there. Sow the seed in there. Let God use you so that you can be useful because you are steady, you are firm, you go long haul. This church from the camp, I mean, from honest with you, from the very beginning in my heart, I want to be the church reaching out to the non-Christian, the lost and the last and the least. Simple house church model is our model that we want to adopt to. 
Now we have come to a place where you saw the glimpse of it. Some of you guys experienced the joy and power and happiness that we can actually have when you have a right house church. We need to go long journey. We cannot be double-minded. We cannot switch back and forth anymore. We will sacrifice some people. We will wait on patiently for some people to turn around, but we will be very clear where we're going to go from here on. Because we need a commitment. Because we want to be fruitful church. I hate to see 20s down the track, Jason, still the same person like he is today. Honestly. You know, I think I will not be happy with myself or Sharon or my wife or Tim having matured enough, matured in 10 years down the track. Then today, we can grow more and more. The one thing I realized is this. It's not going to happen in one year. It's not going to happen in two years. If you want this, give me next 10 years and I'll give you next 10 years. I'm not going to move on. If the last person sitting there and the last chair is ever empty and that's when we close the church down, I will stay here as your pastor. But can you imagine that in my 80s and you'll be in your 60s and this place, I don't know, maybe this or next place, another place, filled with the grandchildren running around, reaching out the lost and the last and the least. We may not be the biggest church. We may not have the most financially secure church, but we will be the church be so faithfully committed to the, the commission of God, reaching out to the people when no one is doing it. Isn't that exciting? And we can stand before the Lord without any shame. God, we try our best. We'll be faithful to your commission. We went to the ends of the earth to make disciples. I think that's one thing that we should commit to. We should be either hot or cold, which means we should be so clear of our color. And if we do that, what happens? This is what happens. Verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be jealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to and says to the church. What he was saying is that, look, I do this. I rebuke you because I love you. I discipline you because I love you. So be zealous. Be hot. You know, come with me. Commit to this. Choose me. Choose me. Give me all you got because I'm going to give you all you got. This is how it says. I'm standing at the door and knock. This is kind of God who is knocking at the door. He's powerful enough to bust the door and walk through it and take you. But he's not that kind of God. He's a God who's knocking and waiting. And handle is inside and you are the one who can open it. The picture is amazing, isn't it? This creator of the universe waiting for you. And he says, if anyone hears my voice, opens the door. Because you hear the voice, everyone hears the voice. Look out the sky, look at the tree, look at the nature. This all, all, all around the place, God is speaking so loud and clear that He's the Lord, He's the King, and He's waiting. Open the door. And He who opens the door, this is what happened. He comes in and He eats with Him. What does it mean to you? God is with you. It means He's there to stay. He comes in to stay. He comes in to make home. He make commitment. He's there for long haul. He's not just going to come in and walk out the moment that you sin, walk out the moment that you watch the pornographic, walk out at the moment that you like, a dis, like dislike God, what not. He's there to stay with you. That's God's commitment. C.S. Lewis, once he put the, his commitment in a such a powerful way, 
in this book called A Mere Christianity. He talks about how, you know, he hates go to dentist, you know, because, uh, you know, when he has an egg, a toothache, he didn't tell mom because I mean, when he goes to mom, mom will give aspirin and make it everything all right. He knew it, but he didn't go to mom because when he tells mom, mom's not going to stop there just giving aspirin. He's, she's going to take him to dentist. The problem with dentist is that dentist will not just stop at looking at that one tit. He's going to look at everything. And the way he puts it like this, the God and, um, and the, in the dentist, um, and the, uh, the, the, in his book, right? It's, I think it's, it's here. Now I may put it that way. Our Lord is like the dentist. If you give him an inch, he will take an L. Means yard, you know, they, they, the, or miles. So if you give him an inch, he will take an L. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some one particular sin which they are ashamed of, like masturbation or physical cowardice, or which is obviously spoiling their life like bad temper or drunkenness. Well, he will cure it, all right, but he, he will, and he will not stop there. That may be all you ask, but if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. That's why he warned people to count the cost before becoming Christians. Make no mistake, he says, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for. Nothing less or other than that. You always... Um, you have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand that I'm going to see the job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever inconvenience, purification it may cost you after death, whatever it costs me, yeah, I will never rest nor let you rest until you are literally perfect. Until my father can say without reservation that he will well pleased with you, as he said, he was well pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will not do anything less. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that so biblically and so right for us? God's commitment to us. That's what Romans chapter 8 talks about. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. God is a God who is committing God. But how can we just play with this amazing God, half-hearted, double-minded, and we always give the lowest priority when it comes to spiritual journey. When you choose to pick between your friend's birthday and coming to church on Sunday, you always pick the, your friend's birthday. It shows about your commitment, definitely. Church work, church ministry, preaching the gospel to the next, uh, your, 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 your non-Christian friend always takes the lowest priority. I think... There's a reason why you're always sitting in the same place and never grow. You're always wrestling with the same sin. You're always struggling with the same issue. You can set yourself free from that. Commit. Apostle Paul, he said this, 2 Timothy 2, 4 to 7, it's not here. Listen carefully. No soldier gets entangled in civil pursuit. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the role. It is a hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the corpse. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Soldier, athlete, farmer. What are the similarities of these three guys? Commitment. Church cannot be just an eventful project. It's a week in, week out, grinding each other, coming together. Look, house church, that's why it's beautiful. When you see something big or brave, as it says uh, in the movie and the uh, video, it says, we always think about the, uh, the what's a giant slayer or dragon slayer. But when you read the Bible, what is the one thing God wants us to commit? Last week's sermons, remember? Love someone sitting next to you. Love one person week in, week out, week in, week out. It's not a glamorous thing. Maybe it's something about that you calling the person and praying for the person and really truly commit to the one group and grow together, help someone to grow together. My vision for the church is old, leading the younger, mature, 
helping the immature, rich, helping the poor, strong, lifting up the weak. Only way it can happen is all those weak, strong, I mean, all the strong, uh, strong, poor, and rich, and uh, mature people commit. When you know how to commit. How do I see the maturity and immaturity? It's not about what you know. You know, you can know all. It's not about what you can do. Ability, it's not even ability. I don't see Sharon is mature because she can play piano. It doesn't work that way. She can be a great lawyer. She can be a great worship leader, but she can be so immature when she does not know how to commit to one thing. Long journey. Bottom line is that, isn't it? I hate to be a pastor of Happy Church for 20 years down the track with you and looking back. And none of you guys have grown. None of you guys have uh, changed your worldview. None of your priority and value system has shifted yet. You just come to church. You just do the ministry. I hate to be that church or in that church. So let's not be. Let's stop being that church. I'll tell you, let's close this church down. If you don't make disciples in 10 years time, if you're still seeing ourselves doing the same thing over and over again without going anywhere, let's close church down and find a better pastor. I don't mind doing that. But I think we should give a shot at this for the next 10 years. Think about it, pray about it, and hope God has give you understanding through the decision. Let's pray.